when you take into account these constraints, you reach the conclusion that green growth has many many challenges or many barriers or many problems that typical models don't see. They say they cover all possible futures. It's not true. There are other narratives that make sense. For me, that's crazy. I mean, this, just this, you know, I, I really have difficulties to, to swallow this pill. Hmm. There is no physical representation of stuff. I mean, when you model, you need to do choices about simplification of reality. And you do your simplifications based on your objectives. You cannot have everything. Uh, so you do some choices. There is not a scientific absolute way to say this is better. No, because mm. it will depend on social decisions. Priorities. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, and today we're going to discuss about the urgent need to develop robust models to guide our policies and actions towards a more safe and just future for humans and the living world. While there is a consensus that we have crossed a multitude of planetary boundaries and we must reduce our emissions to net zero by 2050, the current models and their associated policies can neglect local and global social and biophysical externalities. This leads today to a rather techno-positive policies which underestimate the impacts and overestimate their efficiencies. So how can we build robust models that capture the complex interaction between socioeconomic sphere and the biophysical sphere to test the impacts of bold policies such as universal basic income, 100% renewable energy, and even confront degrowth and green growth worldviews. To help us better understand the importance of these models and how to use them, I have the pleasure to welcome Inigo Catayan Perez, a researcher from the group of Energy, Economy and System Dynamics at the University of Valladolid. Inigo's research focuses on the modeling of energy, economy, environment systems. He is the scientific coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project called Locomotion. In fact, this episode is done through a collaboration with the EEB, the European Environmental Bureau, which is also a partner of the project. More on the project in the description of the episode down below. So with all that being said, Welcome, Inigo, to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to um, to discuss about models. I think uh, they're, they're kind of the the cornerstone today of policy making uh, because it's we live in such a complex world. But perhaps before we start with all of these complex stuff, I want to understand how you got interested into this. Yes. So as a kid, I was always very interested by nature. Not only interested, but really loving it and spending a lot of time. My parents were bringing us to make walks in the forest, in the mountain. So every time. Uh, also, when I grow up, then I start to be involved more in activist movement in my local town, in an organization which is called Ecologistas en Acción, which, by the way, is a member of uh, EEB. Uh, so we were doing in the cities different dissemination activities and, and so on. And one time after one meeting, uh, we were we went to to drink a coffee. Uh, I mean, not to drink some some beer. And there was one member of the group, which at the moment I didn't know her too much, but uh, she is, uh, she was a researcher at the university. Okay. Uh, she's Margarita Mediavilla, and she proposed, she asked me, Inigo, what, uh, are you doing something now? I, didn't, <laughs> I was not doing anything because I finished my studies some months ago, uh, because there is some in, uh, possibility for an internship with us. We are working in energy sustainability. So it will fit with my mm. ideas or my interests and it started it was very bad pay uh, internship <laughs> uh, living with parents and so on and i really loved it because i had the opportunity to to enter this group of energy economy and system dynamics which was just created i was the first member <laughs> non-professor yeah. uh, which they managed to hire somehow uh, so it was like three, four, five professors with a lot of knowledge and me. So it was like I was being supervised by four or five big brains. 
Uh, so I, in this sense, I, I was privileged person. Yeah. So this is my, my story. I mean, I started uh, with them, then I continue, then, well, for there was the economic crisis in Spain was terrible. And, and I had to leave Valladolid because there were no opportunities there. But I got a PhD opportunity in, in the Basque Country, in the University of Basque Country. And after finishing the PhD, I came back to Valladolid. And this is where I am yeah. still. I mean, it must feel great as well to to grow up with a team and then still maintaining, you know, and I guess they work at the same topics for 10 years or so. So they, they accumulate a bunch of knowledge based on projects and and applied in different contexts as well. Yeah. Um, the thing is that now that I have been, when I know the research field from both academia and research mm. institutes, I can see a, a difference mm. in the way science is made. In general, of course, you cannot always generalize, but uh, I, I feel like in the university, because the professors have their position and their teaching, usually the research done at the university was done uh, without a hurry, taking the time to do the things properly. And then they publish at the time, at the beginning, very few papers, maybe one or two per year, not more, um, but very, very novel with great ideas. So the quality of each paper was very high. Mm. Uh, while in research centers, many times you are more driven by projects and then mm, uh, you don't have this time. No, Of course, now our group, when I enter, was like that. But now we have grown, but we are between 20 and 30 people and we are driven by projects. Yeah, of course. We are again in this dynamic, which is not very good or is not the optimum for science. But the people which we had the privilege to start without a hurry, you, we got the time to accumulate a lot of knowledge, which then you can use. Yeah, so it's like a stock. No? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's very interesting because um, when you deal with complex topics, you can't be in a hurry, right? I mean, there is a there is so many interactions to to consider, and the choice is dramatic in terms of what the solutions are at the end. You know, you you enable or disable um, word views or pathways and stuff like that just by including them or not. Sometimes it's not by voluntary, right? A, a number of people don't do it because they think they should exclude well-being. From, from the equation. It's just because they don't know or it's a step by step. And I think that might be also one interesting way to enter into the into modeling. Modeling is quite difficult. Mm. So many times people just use a model which already exists. That's because it's easier. Mm. Because you take a model, you press the button, you get some numbers. And you change one number, you, change, you obtain different numbers. If you do this four times, you have four scenarios, you can publish. <laughs> so the, what I want to say is that there is a lot of inertia in the mm. sense that there are some models which have be, are being developed for many years, which are very well known, especially in big institutes. In big institutes have invested a lot of money and time in some key models, and they are not going to get rid of these models so easily, mm. just because... Uh, they, it's their tool, no? So develop new models, of course, it's possible and it happens. But uh, what I want to say is that it's difficult and that there is inertia against that. Mm. Yeah. And also another thing about models is that uh, many times uh, there are many models but which share uh, a lot of central assumptions. You have exactly. a false plurality of models. There are many, several reasons for this. One reason I think very important is that each institution wants to have their own tool. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be dependent on the tool of others. So you have your tool, you do, you give a different name. Maybe the central, there are of course always some differences. Yeah, so there is like the JCAM, the MessageX, the DICE and all of these. Uh... Hmm. I, now, if, for example, I was thinking also in a specific models. If okay. we talk, for example, in energy models... You have a plethora of models. Of course, there are always differences, but many assumptions are the same. Economic models, because then integrated system models is the putting together these uh, specific models. No? Mm. So they replicate yeah. many times what it is already in the field. So just before, what is a model when they're used in terms of integrated assessment model? What does that mean? A model, okay, yes. Well, uh, 
When you have one model, uh, of course, it's one model. It's mm. code. Uh, it's a lot of lines of code, and everything is interacting with everything. But uh, when you are dealing with large models, uh, we need to conceptually organize a bit the content. Mm. And what we do is uh, we divide by modules what we mean that are sub parts of the model, which represent a, a, a a bigger system. Mm, yes, for example, if in IAMS we talk about energy module, economy module, demography module, and then um, you work with the interlinkages between modules. For all of the models, you more or less have the same modules every time, or what? Mm, I mean, every developer of an interdependent model can have the modules that he or she wants. Mm. It depends on the dimensions you want to represent. Mm. For example, I can just to be concrete in William. We have modules for demography, society, economy, finance, energy, materials, uh, land use, water, and climate. For example, uh, we, we don't have biodiversity explicitly modeled. Mm. If we will incorporate this, this will be a, a, a probably its own module, no? With interactions, of course, with the other modules, but conceptually. This is, I mean, needed because... To develop an integrated assessment model requires a lot of work for many people. And you need experts of each module, but mm. you also need people able to work on the, in the whole picture. And this is what's more my role. I mean, in locomotion, I am co-coordinator of materials and energy modules. And also I am the general, let's say, not alone with uh, another colleague uh, in Valladolid, uh, Ignacio de Blas, we were doing the, the scientific coordination and trying to make all the pieces match, but it's not us alone, but with the, all the coordinators of modules. So in, in order to have a fully integrated model, you need to have a lot of conversations, you need to have a lot of workshops to try things, how to connect, how to make everything consistent. So from what I understand, we do these models mainly is for a couple of things, more or less to understand how everything is linked and how if you push there, what is the impact there. But also more and more this is used for policy making, right? So what is the the output? Once you have this model, what happens with the model? Well, first thing to say is that a model do, do not produce results. Mm -hmm. You need to uh, test a narrative and quantify a scenario. Yeah. This is important. And you need I, to put inputs in so it gives you outputs. Yeah, because a model is just a program. It's nothing. It's not going to tell you anything by itself. And I, I will. I like to give the example of the of the limits to growth report, uh -huh. uh, where many people in the critiques to the model, there were some critiques which could be valid, but many, most of them were just unscientific. <laughs> um, they they call the the War Three model a model of doom. Yeah, and this is very interesting because. Uh, in the original report, there are 12 scenarios and there are seven, some of them at the end which are not collapse scenarios. Mm -hmm. They are stabilization, st st steady state. But it became a, a famous sentence model of doom, like always it collapsed. And it's not true, but it was a way to dismiss uh, the model, of course, unscientifically. So when you want to do, uh, I mean, you have a model which uh, is designed for some purpose. You cannot do whatever with it. Even if we try to represent many dimensions, you cannot do whatever. Uh, you need to be sure that it is ready to answer your questions. It's for that that uh, this type of models, you never finish developing them because, okay, you develop something, you answer some questions, and then come follow-up questions. But then maybe you need to add some functionality, and then you need to continue developing. So... Um, Yes. So then when you have your research question, you set up a methodology to analyze it properly. You get, and then you try to get some objectives, uh, some goals. And usually there is an iteration, as you said, in the sense that you have a narrative, you parameterize your inputs. Parameterize inputs means uh, put numbers to the inputs. And then you run and you see if your goals are reached. It may happen that, imagine you have five goals and you reach three. But then you need to come back to the, maybe to the parameterization to make some policy more stringent or, or soften one policy which has unintended effects. Maybe you need to add policies. Mm -hmm. And if this does not work, what you need to do is to revise your narrative. And what, what I mean with narrative? With narrative, I mean, for example, 
we have the green growth narrative, you have post growth narrative, and this is for all the model. But if you are talking about transport, more specific, for example, you can think about a light vehicles narrative, uh, public transport. So uh, the narrative is the story because, you, I mean, a model of these uh, characteristics has dozens to hundreds of inputs and each of them can have many dimensions. Because, for example, okay, you say, okay, I have 100 policies. For each policy, maybe you need to parameterize hundreds also of numbers. So mm. you need to have a system that your what you are simulating is consistent. So, for example, it does, if you are simulating, if you are simulating, I don't know, in agriculture, this um, meat to be grown, you know, I don't know, uh, hydro... Uh, hydroponics, yeah. Uh, thank you, hydroponic, yeah. which is a very, let's say, uh, intensive way, a um, modernist which is aligned with green growth. And then in another part of the model, you implement, I don't know, in transport, some degrowth policies. Mm. This is nonsense because the society is one and the society is not going to do different things. It's going to work to, to evolve in the future with some coherence. So the narrative is very, very important. And here we can also come back to your question about central assumptions. And one of the central assumptions, especially in IPCC, uh, in IPCC models, and this is a requirement from IPCC, because even if IPCC is uh, always in the press and in the street identified as a scientific body, but the eye of IPCC is uh, intergovernmental. We don't have never to forget this. The governments have a role. And, and in the IPCC process, uh, for the models, they are required that GDP per capita and population are exogenous. So can you explain uh, that? That means that the, there are some pathways of GDP per capita growth which uh, are not negotiable. So uh, the, the models answer the question, <coughs> IPCC models, uh, which technological deployment in many, many sectors I need to do to match with this GDP per capita growth and a population um, pathway which is usually aligned with uh, United Nations. This is one of the constraints that they need to keep and that the intergovernmental panel is actually their given guidelines. Mm -hmm. The scenarios from IPCC of GDP per capita and population, until now this was like that. Mm, so, other assum central assumptions will be, for example, in general, these models uh, function, not all of them, but most of them work under the logic of optimization. Um, typically, they have a carbon tax and they in, uh, try to find the carbon tax which uh, minimize or reach a target in temperature or in emissions. Well, uh, in our models, we do policy simulation, not policy optimization, because we think that the world doesn't work optimizing anything. <laughs> um, and also because uh, it, it's a very strong assumption that a carbon tax or a, or a price can dri drive everything. Mm -hmm. So we know that prices are very crazy, that there are a lot of uh, influences, and there also there is a lot of behavior of humans which do not correspond with prices. So it's not that it is uh, not related, but it is not all driven by that. So this policy, this optimization procedure is one difference, also which is very, very important. And then uh, other limitations of models is that, for example, that they are blind to some uh, dimensions, which for us, for example, are very important. Um, for example, until very, very recently, no integrated assessment model had a representation of materials. Mm. Uh, for me, that's crazy. I mean, this, just this mm. is a, you know, I, I really have difficulties to, to swallow this pill. Mm. There is no physical representation of stuff. Well, they have energy and they have technology, uh, mostly. And then they have also land use. Land use became a very hot topic because of bioenergy. No, but still, I mean, without materials, you don't have energy. Without materials, you, it's a stock, and therefore the stock needs to maintain itself, which will require new materials. I don't know. If you don't have a stock within your model, what, what is happening as well? Another central assumption is the assumption of very, very abundant energy. Yeah. Both non-renewable and renewable. So 
Um, also, they work uh, on the, the material thing is not so very important for them in general because oh, more materials will be discovered and they will be mined if there is a price because there is a demand, the price will increase the amount of reserves. So they are totally is the, the paradigm of uh, um, conventional economics that economic um, is a bit uh, isolated from environment because uh, they can do whatever. Yeah. And also other, another critic from the IPCC models which, by the way, yesterday was highlighted by the policy officer, is the lack of uh, climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. So by definition, the IPCC models focus on mitigation, but it's not real. We are already one point, I don't remember, two degrees. We already have impacts. Yeah. So if you want to represent the reality, you need to have this impact. So, And I think there is also, when I was talking with uh, Lawrence Geiser, he was also mentioning there's no convergence between let's say, the, the rich industrial countries and uh, the emerging countries in terms of they should meet at the middle, you know, in terms of material requirements, be to, uh, the, the income, the GDP, all should somehow converge at a certain point, right? If we want to be just. Yes, but the IPCC scenarios don't go in this direction. Yeah. So it, it's funny how... This is the narrative. So yeah. it's like the IPCC does an effort to cover all... They say they cover all possible futures... It's not true. There are other narratives that make sense, but they are outside of the IPC. But there are other research groups which, with our uh, capabilities, we modestly try to to test them. So, from what I understand, the the IPCC gives a brief to all of the modelers. We would like to test this, 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 and that. Run your models and give us what the scenarios are. Well, it's not so direct or so like uh, command, no. But uh -huh. you have. IPCC is already 30 years, a lot of meetings to try to harmonize inputs, outputs, uh, intermodel comparison projects. It's a relatively small community. They know each other a lot. They collaborate a lot. So it's more the result of a community than the result of heterogeneous groups doing different things. I, I don't know what is the, pos the margin for being more pluralistic or... Um, But at the end, it's a political process. If the mm -hmm. post-growth um, scenario is politically not uh, a topic in the IPCC, then we, maybe they can do some research or can do something with these models, but it's not going to be at the core of the yeah. IPCC. But I don't know how much this can change because I have the feeling that, for example, in the European Union, uh, many years ago, these topics of the growth, post-growth were very um, outside. And now more and more you see uh, research grants or projects uh, which are explicitly focusing on mm. these post-growth ideas. In, at the European level, I, I don't know also how sustainable is this on, over time. I don't know if in some years there will be some elections and then everything will change. But what I see is that at the European level, at least there is an uh, acknowledgement This is maybe important. We have to take a look. We have to take care of what they are saying. Even if still we have our methods, our inertia and our modeling teams doing. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, the amount of projects that are now funded in the post-growth sphere, there is five ERC in post-growth as well or more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's relatively exciting. I'm just afraid this is not just a buzzword that's going to, you know, then die off for a new buzzword uh, as we have seen in the past but i think there is also a, a more fundamental science of post growth starting to be established meaning that we now have the arguments we now have the models we now have the data we now have the narratives and i think there is a i don't think we are so mature eh? no but I but, mean, but we're starting right i mean uh, we have the okay. we have now all of the pieces because before it was a lot of narratives not necessarily the models or before we had models and not necessarily the narratives And I think there is a convergence slowly. Well, my opinion is a bit different mm -hmm. in the sense that for, uh, we were, I was in the Zagreb uh, degrowth conference this mm -hmm. year. I mean, 80% or 90% of the presentations are qualitative um, social science. And I'm, I have, of course, nothing against social science, but I have something against the disbalance. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if we don't have quantitative methods, we will never become concrete. And then when you need to give a policy recommendation specific, then you are not able. You can only give some general ideas. And these general ideas are great because are the basis for any quantitative analysis. 
and we need them and without them we are lost but without quantitative analysis we will not manage to uh, progress further mm. and there is an enormous disbalance but it's true that i see a uh, growing interest in quantitative methods in this post-growth yeah. idea yeah. and we get a lot of uh, people interested in the models we develop especially young researchers so yes i see a change but it's going to take time yeah yeah i know you're right and i think it's also hard for me because i come from the engineering world to to deconstruct my mind of an engineer thinking that with the right numbers with the right policy just things are going to change this is not true as well so we really need somehow to to bring forces together and also well every every field has its own biases Yeah. Um, we need to remove as much as possible all these biases and put together all the pieces. Um, we have not talked yet about uh, William, mm -hmm. which is the name of the I am pro I mean the integrated assessment model that is, if I understand correctly, like the improvement of Medeas, a previous integrated assessment model, but is the one that you have within the locomotion project. What was a, a bit the rationale within the locomotion project? What were your, okay, something was not there yet, and we wanted to firstly address some of the central assumptions that we just mentioned before, but also that you wanted to improve methodologically from the previous uh, IAM. Yes, so, well, in the Medeas project, which was a H2020 project uh, with many tasks and objectives, one of the important tasks was to build the Medeas models, uh, which my group was fully in charge. Um, and then when we finished Medeas, uh, it's like uh, we had the feeling that um, like instead of finishing something, we were like, not starting, but opening a lot of uh, door, uh, new, do new doors. And also we wanted to uh, have help with modeling uh, to share the burden. And also because we in the group, in my group, we don't have all the expertise mm. for everything we of wanted course. to model. No? So of we course. look for some potential partners specialized in some topics. So the locomotion project is designed as a follow-up of Medeas uh, with this idea of incorporating modelers. Uh, at the core of the project. It's true that the idea was to improve, uh, the original idea was to improve Medeas, but the reality is that we have made practically a new model in all senses. <laughs> so yeah. the remaining parts from Medeas, I will say, is not more than 15%. Was that because of, because of new narratives that you changed so much, or was it also scientifically some things did not make sense anymore? Or also programmatically, we, we just found new routines and we thought that was more important. I think, I mean, when you prepare a project, you have a plan, uh, you have a proposal and you have to be sufficiently specific uh, so the reviewers can um, assess that you are doing what you, they, yeah. you are requested and so on. But it's true that you don't write all the details. So Uh, we, when you get the project, um, we are coordinators of the project, but we are not directors. Mm. So we cannot give orders to anybody. This is not the idea. The idea is that we coordinate and each partner has a say and we have to try to agree uh, as much as possible. Of course, when you are so many people, it's impossible to agree 100% on everything. We did our best. Um, some people are more happy with some parts, others less happy with these parts. Um, and then we have each partner has its opinion no? on how to improve. Or So I think uh, why it's so different is because there are some modeling teams which are very capable and very ambitious. And then they have um, great ideas that, um, including ourselves, that you uh, try to do maybe more things that you plan at the beginning mm -hmm. or also because i mean this is research so it's impossible to anticipate <laughs> everything of course yeah so well, for example you think okay i will do this task and then when you start to do it then you realize there are some hidden tasks behind required task for this preparatory task if you want data or whatever that take a lot of time and you didn't anticipate and this mm. has happened a lot to us because especially for the linkages between modules mm. because 
we had anticipated one full work package for the linkages, but it has taken much more work than we thought. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we are doing things that in many, many things we are doing things that no one to our knowledge has done it. So you have to try things, maybe work, no. Then also we have the computational problems because the model is very big. We have very, a lot of dimensions. So there are some things that maybe um, do you know how to do them, but they take too much time and then you need to simplify in order to have a model which runs in a reasonable time. You mentioned the modules, like we have land and water, climate, energy, materials, demog- uh, demography and society, economy and finance. Uh, you also had like a temporal scope and also a geographical scope. I think what's something which for me was very interesting or very promising is that your narratives opened up to some less explored paths, let's say. Um, So these are two, in my opinion. First is, of course, all of the justice element. uh, And this can be like a a fair transition. This can be a post-growth transition. This can be an equality transition, that type of sphere. And then the other type of sphere for me, which was extremely interesting, but I have a huge bias, is the material inter- interaction between all of that, right? So when you're talking about materials, of course, it's, it has an impact to everything, to, to land, it has an impact to water. When we see lithium, what is the impact of that? It has an impact of energy, and it's also bidirectional, right? I mean, you need materials for energy, you need energy for materials, and so it complexifies this so much more. A comment to what you have said, yeah. many of the feedbacks with materials and other modules are not represented in the model. Mm-hmm. Some of them we are working on them and some of them are out of, outside of the scope. Yes, yeah. Not to give you, an idea that no, we have so much integration, of course. No, uh, but you mentioned, I think, like, um, uh, what was it? Material scarcity or mineral scarcity? Yes. Or already this seemed to be like a essential, you know? Yes, no, I was thinking, you mentioned, I think, uh, links between materials and land use. Well, if in materials you include wood, yes. Yeah. But if you are thinking about mining impact, no. Because one thing I should say is that this is a model which does not have geographical detail. Mm. We have regions. Yeah, so you have region, the rest of the world. India, yeah, we have yeah. China. So we are not able to see uh, local issues. You have, what, 40... We have nine big regions yeah. of the world, which are, let's say, Russia, China, India, Southeast Asia. We have um, North America, mm-hmm. and we have many countries of Latin America, and then we have the uh, rest of the world. And then in the European, for the European Union, in some modules, we have everything aggregated, and in other modules, we have the detail of each member state. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this regionalization is in our case driven by the availability of economic data. Okay. When we report results, we have to be, take a lot of care of, about this. Yeah. Well, I guess some policies are good for everything and some others are very context specific, right? Or let's say economic specific to, to some of them. But uh, I mean, when you model, you need to do choices about simplification of reality and you do your simplifications based on your objectives. In our sense, our objectives were of course, European Union, because we are here, because we are funded by the European Union project, and we have a lot of detail of many countries, but it's, uh, you cannot have everything. Uh, so you do some choices. Maybe if you are more focused on land use, for example, then you will need to have another disaggregation, another type of model, whatever. But in our case, because for post-growth, I mean, if we, are, we really want to compare green growth and post-growth, you need to have a lot of s- um, social policies, economic policies. So you need to have... Uh, you cannot uh, forget this dimension, which is very, very often forgotten in green growth, uh, maybe narratives, because the assumption is no society. I mean, we will do technical fixes, no, and it will take care of uh, society. Yeah, claro. Yeah. So magically, uh, well, it's the assumption. Yes. Mm, if you go to the street and you ask, in most countries, in my opinion, you this will be a majority opinion. Yes, but I think that's also it's also difficult to to say that because. They're not given the entire truth, you know, or the entire... Yes, of course, problem. but it's the situation. Yeah, yeah. I, but it's normal. If you, uh, if you give some people just a, a tiny element of choice within a tiny uh, agency as well, they're going to say, okay, let's do that, uh, which seems feasible. But uh, if you tell them, do you want to also live well? Do you prefer living well or do you prefer, uh, you know, having, uh, I don't know, 
exploiting uh, nature and society elsewhere. Uh, you know, people are never going to say yes to that as well. So there are hidden assumptions in, in all of that. Um, I saw in the material module, you had an example, I think, for one base metal, which was copper. And over there, there was one node, which I found very interesting, which was called the demand from economy, which kind of drives a number of things, right? And I'm wondering whether this also exists like in, um, in energy and in some other elements, because for me, demand seems to, or, you know, latest, uh, the, the latest report of IPCC kind of shifts a bit towards demand driven policies rather than supply driven policies. And over there, we, it's kind of a Trojan horse for sufficiency, right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how does that fit within the narrative? Was that already existing there? Or do you see the demand as uh, an important lever to, to tackle or question sufficiency stuff? So your question is about behavioral change, no? In general, because, the, I mean, you have the demand, you have the supply. Yeah. If they do not match, there will be some adjustment. And in what you are mentioning about copper, this is what we have. There is an economic demand to produce uh, to, to produce some goods and services to uh, fulfill the demand. The final demand in monetary terms, but then you need raw material demand, you need energy. So this comes to arrive, if we are talking about copper, to the material module. And the material module has a representation of the ore grades of copper. And of course, when the ore grade becomes um, degraded, even if you have some technological improvement, in general, the price will cost because it's non-linear. And then you will keep give back to the economy this price of copper, and then there will be some adjustment. But this is a this mecha is, mechanistic point of view, right? Hmm, I mean, it's more of a biophysical. This is a standard economics, and well, um, there are also some problems with this approach from a theoretical point of view. But this is the way we have deal with in, in, the, in the model, because even if this approach can be criticized, um, to my knowledge, I, I'm not sure to have a better option right now. Um, what we did in Medeas, for example, and we still are doing for some metals here, not for copper, is that uh, because, I mean, the demand of copper, we know very well from economy because we have a sector, we have input output structure and we have a sector of production of copper. So we have four material sector uh, individuals, which are nickel, um, copper, aluminum, and maybe iron. Mm -hmm. Then we know from the input output, but for the rest of metals, we have some aggregated sectors based on uh, rest of metals. So this is all aggregated. You don't see anything. So we have some bottom-up calculations which come from the Medeas approach. And what we do is to try to compute the demand of these materials um, and then compare with the available reserves and resources from USGS or whatever, an external source, and then you track how much you are consuming of this yeah, stock. the difference between the two, yeah. And for some materials, in some scenarios, you... Mm, you don't deplete the reserves, in others you deplete the reserves, and this is what we call a scarcity indicator, mm. but we don't feedback the scarcity in the model in the sense that, okay, you don't have silver, then you stop installing PV. It will be extremely easy to do if then else reserves zero, below zero, um, no more PV. This is five minutes. But... The question if, it's, if it really makes sense, no? Because there are the, that data about the reserves of many metals is very bad. It also a lot fluctuates, of, you know? I mean, if you do exploration and the reserves get bigger, and how hmm. do you... Uh, basically, we didn't have uh, sufficient time to analyze this issue of materials, reserves, and resources. So we took some data that we know are not robust. So we think it's more fair not to feedback, but give the information that... Okay, if you believe that this source of information, of data, of reserves, of silver, you lead it, then you have to uh, consume all of it. The message is the same, if you feed back in the model or not. You know, it's like um, the models are tools to make us think. Yes. Many times models are very misused. And it's interesting <laughs> that uh, there are many people 
I don't know if you have interviewed these uh, people with this view in those podcasts, but I would recommend because they have a point. They criticize a lot of models and they think that models will, are not useful. Uh -huh. Uh, and I think, well, there are always some theoretical uh, points which can, okay, you can agree. Um, but I think in, for many people, uh, they have seen so much misuse of models of course. that they uh, identify modeling as a bad scientific practice. It's because, as I said, it's very easy to get numbers from a model. But and the central assumptions can be that bad that yeah, can be yeah. hidden and if you are a user maybe you are not aware of them and um, you can misuse the model and you cannot understand very well what you are doing you will always get numbers yeah. so it's very it's dangerous I think it's a, a guy a guy called Box or something like that who said like all oh, models are wrong some are useful but uh, uh, it's a um, famous sentence yeah, in modeling yeah. in modeling field yes I think I didn't answer your previous question about this, the novelties or the strong points yes. of William. No, maybe this is uh, quite important. So for us, maybe the central point, and that, that's the reason we call the model William. William means within limits. Yam. So we are very interested about the introducing in the socioeconomic sphere biophysical potential limitations. Mm. Because when you take into account these constraints with different dimensions, then it could, you, could, you reach the conclusion that green growth has many, many challenges or many barriers or many problems that typical models don't see. So if you don't, your model is not able to represent these problems, you don't see them and then it's feasible. No? So it's, everything is interrelated. So I would say these two points are uh, important, and then in, from the point of view of methodology, this is uh, um, this uh, alternative approach um, is represented in many things. We have a lot, for example, we have an economic module very detailed. Mm. Then this facilitates the linkage with other parts of the model because if you don't have an economic module, then you cannot uh, do these interactions. Uh, then we have dimensions that are missing, as I mentioned, materials. A society, finance. In terms of potentials, we take into account uh, availability, what we think are reasonable avail availabilities of fossil fuels. But this, for example, many times is not well understood because the idea is well, if we need to get rid of them, why is it so important to model them, let's say, yeah. a peak oil thing? But now we are using 80% of fossil fuels. If you want to represent a transition from state A to state B, seriously, you need to have a good representation of the starting point. The fossil fuels are going to be very important in the next years because you, it's the base energy to do the transition. With what to are do you going the to do? Yeah. So it's important to have a representation. To spend a lot of time modeling fossil fuels doesn't mean that we want <laughs> them to be. But many times it's not well understood. I just want yeah. to stress. In typical energy models, the energy potentials are exogenous. You do a literature yeah. review for a country. Um, you take some numbers, okay, they say that you can install so much wind, the bioenergy pot sustainable potential is whatever, but the bioenergy potential depends on land uses because you can, if you plant a lot of forests and you decide to, to or you plant a lot of biofuels, you decide to do these policies, it will have consequences on food, Blah, blah, blah. But the fact of having everything hard linked makes the story consistent. It's the same for solar. Of yeah. course, there is a lot of room for solar panels, but they will take room from other uses. So it's important to have this interaction and, and to be able of the consequences. And then one also maybe novelty, which is interesting, we are still working on it, is that the fact that the model, I mean, the model, another limitation is that uh, the frequency is one year. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? That uh, we don't see a summer, winter variation, day, night. In order to design an energy system uh, based on renewables, it, the state of the art says that you need at least early resolution. One hour, hour yes. by hour, 8,760. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, I already mentioned the computational problems of our <laughs> model. If you will multiply by almost 9,000, uh, it's unfeasible. So what we have done is to develop an emulator from an early model called Energy Plan. An emulator, we basically de derive some regressions. Um, 
that we incorporate into William and that emulate the behavior of this uh, hourly model in William. So it's very novel and we have some preliminary results which are promising, but still we need to finish. And another thing that I think we are novel is uh, modeling of uh, hydrogen. Okay. When we started the project, I mean, when we started the project, there was no COVID, okay. no uh, Green Deal package. Ah, so so you, you were thinking about it before the EU kind of... Uh... No, we decided on the way. Okay. Um, so we, this is one example of more work because the reality changes. Yeah. And also I, I would like to stress that uh, the, the model is still not uh, finished. Uh, we will release, of course, at the end of the project in December, end of the, uh, November, uh, what we have. We have to disclose everything, but it's not going to be possible to, to release a model as we would like, mm -hmm. validated and robust. And I think here I should say that the COVID uh, hit us very hardly, mm -hmm. because the only way to make this thing work is to have workshops, uh, physical workshops where everybody meet and problems and we test things and with uh, online meetings, it was not uh, so functional. When it was again possible to travel, uh, we started to do every two, three months, one workshop with 10, 12 modelers. And then we progress a lot, but we already had a delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, we will release the model and we will explain what is the quality of that model and we will continue working in the next months to have a, a proper version. So when you talk about biophysical constraints, what do you mean? I mean, is it kind of downscaling of, uh, of planetary boundaries or what, what, what is the constraint there? There are different types. One type is, for example, materials. Mm. And even if it's a constraint, you don't need to... Uh, um, hard program that constraint and I gave the example of the scarcity indicator no? so the idea is that economy uh, even if uh, it is uh, the quantity is usually represented in euros uh, behind that there are physical physical things materials, mm -hmm. energy, kilograms of food, kilograms of whatever so the idea is that the model is able to represent as a mirror yeah. Or as two sides of the coin, yeah. the monetary dimension and the physical dimension. And then we are tracking, we track things. Some things are hard linked, others not, depending on the difficulty. Or yeah, I mean, So if you say you are producing X electricity, we have the terawatt hours of the different sources. And if you yeah. want to be 100 renewables and you have enormous demand and your country does not have sufficient uh, potential, then you need to import or whatever, but we account in this way. In this sense, all models account for that, but the difference is that we are with our integration and some assumptions that we do that we think that are more realistic, the potentials are, for some of them, especially for wind, are lower than for other yeah. models. Um, so we also had this behavioral aspect. You call it behavioral. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure it's 100% be or what is the extent of behavioral element to it and how much is other. So... Um, like sufficiency in the IPCC is defined as a set of political measures and individual actions or something like that that reduce na, 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 for the different elements within planetary boundaries and for well-being, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have different pieces, but at the very top it says it's a set of measures, first political and then individual, right? I think there is no consensus in the literature about the definition of behavioral change. Some people also talk about lifestyle change. Yes. So in my group, I think the understanding, I mean, we do a dichotomy between technological changes and, and behavioral changes in the sense that behavioral change is what you, an individual with your uh, own uh, behavior, you can change. So for example, the typical examples are diet change, uh, not having a car, not taking the plane, of course. Of course, but I mean, you know, the infrastructure needs to be yes, there. If yes. there is a political will and there is cycling paths, the your behavioral change or be, is much more... Yes, there are the enable, agency, enablers. Exactly, the agency is completely different there. Yes, um, I, I agree totally with you and we also take this, of course, into account. 
Um, but I can, I have, can say that modeling this is a bit challenging. We are yeah. exploring a bit for transport, these enablers, because of course, if you don't want to take the, the train, uh, sorry, the plane, but the combination by train is three days, that's the problem. Uh, but also this is very specific and our models are not so able or targeted for these things. So many times at the end, a model, uh, you can capture everything, so you need to have boundaries. Yeah. And in our case, this type of things many times are boundaries. So this is mm. part of the narrative. Mm. If we, I mean, if there is an investment in railway, for example, so then when you produce, you report results, you need to provide the narrative to be consistent. So it yeah. goes together. If yeah. you only provide numbers, no, it's not useful. Yeah. No, because I'm thinking, for instance, uh, insulation, right? In in buildings. Yes. That's technolo technological change for your opinion. But in reality, we can also capture it as behavioral change because you as a person reduce your heating. Right? Yes, it's, uh, it's not so clear. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But in the model, it's true that sometimes we need to be simplified to <laughs> put some order. Yes. Yeah. But that will be, for example, efficiency. You are with less energy, you are heating the same. What will be sufficiency? You put a sweater. Yes. Or you reduce You're the... Right. I'm not suggesting to do this, but that will be behavioral change. Yes. And then if you do both things, then yeah. it will be a combination of two policies. But in the model, uh -huh. it's like two factors that yes. sum up. Okay. I think it's important that people understand now that we have the model, what do we do with it as well? Like what is the interface with outside of the modeling world, right? Small break before the next part. If you enjoy this independent podcast, you can support me on TP. The link is in the description below. You can also help me reach more people by subscribing and leaving a comment. Many thanks and on to the next part. So we've talked about the model and the modules of the model and a bit the interlinkages. As you said, a model is not there to, to tell you any truth or to <laughs> tell you what to do. You need interactions with stakeholders to do something with it in order to get valuable insights. Um, and of course, we can think of policymakers, that's the first type of stakeholder. We can, we can think about other type of um, stakeholders you mentioned at the very beginning that you were with civil society movements as well. So I think it's important as well how people that are not experts deal with such interesting models. With the Medeas model, we develop um, a game that uh, we have been using a lot after the end of the project in our classes, in our courses in university, but also with civil society. It's, we call it a game. It's basically a way that uh, non-experts can run the model and then you can get a discussion and so on. But what do they do with this? So do they have sliders and they say, okay, we're going to do more of this, more of that, and this yes, is the result? Yes, basically, yes. Yeah. And then they see the results. Most of the times they are surprised because the effects of their choices they do not match with their intuitions yeah because this is the idea of game uh, you can i can do a presentation and explain what you get and this is very passive but if you interact with people in this way they get more involved and they have you know someone had one idea and then you are telling them he's wrong so usually people are curious <laughs> why i was wrong or maybe you are wrong so then you give explanations and then I think it's um, the process of transmitting information is much better. I, we like a lot this um, way of doing, but it requires a lot of time. A lot of time and a lot of people from expert to be able to moderate. And lately we have stopped doing it just because we were so overwhelmed with mm -hmm. uh, William that these type of things then in science, the first thing that suffers if you are stressed is dissemination <laughs> because uh, it's not your duty. Uh, in Spain, it's not almost no val uh, valued in uh, uh, CVs or for positions. So you need to cut somewhere. It's first, <laughs> it's, uh, it's unfortunately, dissemination. I know. Uh, doing this type of podcast while being in academia was a, a tricky <laughs> situation. Yeah. And then uh, the idea in the project was to develop a set of uh, applications to allow um, non-experts to run the model. And here there are different layers of complexity. We also had a, a, a game, which was based on the idea of the Medeas game. But because the, the model is not going to be finished, then mm -hmm. the results that this application are showing 
currently are not let's say fully reliable mm. and we would like in the future to to improve i mean to update this application with the model but this uh, remains open because the project will be finished we can then talk about some of the the policies that you have explored or you wanted to explore the the impacts on well uh, i would like to say something like um I always say that a model is like a puzzle and if the puzzle has 100 pieces and you are missing five pieces, your puzzle is not finished. And this is the situation we have with the model um, that we have some important pieces uh, missing and then we cannot use the whole model because of that. But still there are very large parts of the model and interaction between modules that are working more or less properly and then we are able to extract what we call partial results. Mm. So, of course, with um, less integration that we would like, and this are, at the end is an assumption, you are able to produce some results. And this is what we have in this uh, deliberable about policy recommendation, no? But just to uh, make a disclaimer that, <laughs> when, for example, we test the universal basic income, there are linkages to economy that are missing in yeah. there in terms of climate change impacts or from an energy tra transformation and so on. So it's more uh, in an economic model to test this universal basic income. And these are partial also results because you are touching select, uh, you are touching some parts of the model, not everything. In order to build a consistent transition scenario, you need to touch all the modules simultaneously mm -hmm. in a coherent way. This, until the model is not fully validated and robust, it doesn't make sense to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps the ones that you chose were because the modules were ready and all of this mm -hmm. rather than maturity of modules yeah. and interest of the topic also with eb we we selected um, hot topic let's say for yeah. you that's the reason we have critical materials we have a hydrogen yeah. biofuels uh, universal basic income degrowth yeah. green growth yeah mm -hmm. okay so perhaps we can just explore some of them just to see what it means right so when i read the the degrowth versus degro uh, green growth i see that some of the policies that come out of it is redefine the meaning of just transition redistributive policies uh, minimum wage guarantee sufficient financial resources so like quite understood mechanisms right or not that well accepted but uh, unfortunately yet but you know if someone is doing that is already in the world of post growth these are some of the uh, the policies that they already have in mind mm -hmm. but the power of the model is to test what happens once you do it right i mean this is the chapter where it is used i think eurogreens because one thing in this deliverable is that uh, we are using uh, depending on the chapter william and there's also there is one using gcam and now i I don't remember if we have more, but and this paper is very interesting because it shows that all each narrative has advantages and disadvantages. There is okay. no perfect solution. I remember, if I'm not wrong, in the degrowth scenario, the the depth I think uh, increases a lot. Yeah. So uh, of course, until we don't, uh, until we are not able to run the full William, I cannot answer your question properly. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. my intuition even before seeing these results from PISA um, is that there is no perfect solution because the problems that we face are very complex and when you solve one problem in one part you can create problems in others unintendedly so I think it's quite interesting though you, you mentioned that when running this uh, model we also see for instance the greenhouse gas emissions compared to today the degrowth is by far the, the one that achieves the, the most decrease so over there, I think it's quite interesting to to see some biophysical, some social, but then you also introduce some economic or financial one, which are the debt elements. Of course, this comes out of our discussion of scientists to, well, should we just uh, eliminate debt? And therefore, at the end of the day, you have Gini coefficient, which is going in the right direction, greenhouse gas emissions that are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I can imagine it's very hard to to negotiate once you have these results, right? I mean, at the end, when you learn applying this type of models is the transition, even if for many years it has been explained as a technological thing, it's a social and political thing. There are choices and different choices imply different outcomes and there is not a scientific 
absolute abstract way to find to say this is better no because mm. it will depend on social decisions priorities if we for example talk about behavioral change and we need to shrink consumption to reduce for example emissions or in general environmental footprint i don't know maybe some people uh, will become vegan um but will take a plane i don't know once per five years because they really like to travel far but maybe some people love meat you know but they will never take the plane I don't want to say that all the solutions are behavioral change, but what I yeah, want yeah. to say is that there are uh, there are social individual and also social decisions about where the budget of the country goes. This is totally political and social, and you can favorize some sectors or others yeah. how much. So these, you're absolutely right. How much they're entrenched in social political challenges. I think there are some others that also go into completely different directions. If I take, uh, let's say, batteries, right? Which, well, Europe is really going towards the decarbonization, well, of the energy system, let's say. Then you add geopolitical issues. You also add the this flow versus stock dynamic, like are we going to have enough at the right time uh, of lithium? So it's not even a, a, a matter of stock. It's more of a matter of flow. Both, well, yes. I think it... It brings up biophysical, geopolitical, and political elements that are fascinating. This is a very good example also with choices, no? Uh, in Spain, there are several proposals for lithium mines. Mm -hmm. um, are people ready to have some lithium mines and having cars, electric cars, or they will prefer not private cars and no lithium mine? Of course, it's a simplification, but we cannot get everything. Yeah. How do we navigate with these models? What, what, how can they help us explicit right choices, right? Because I think that's also one of the difficult elements is that today we, we think that the only way forward is by doing this, uh, a techno fix, let's say, uh, and this implies, well, a new form of neocolonialism, if you will, from, central, uh, from Latin America, right? We, we accept that we need to decarbonize, we accept we need a lot of lithium, And therefore, we, we don't accept or we, we don't hear about this will impact the, the land use over there, this will impact the society over there, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how can uh, these type of models help us better explicit the real choices that are in front of us? Yeah, I think for me, there are like two main types of applications. <clears throat> First application will be uh, to show that the green growth paradigm has some important barriers. And this you do by integrating ideas or information that is not in conventional models. I'm going to give you an example, some examples. Uh, now, at the European uh, Union level, it's very clear that biofuels can be more carbon intensive over life cycle than fossil fuels under some circumstances. But how How are you going to see this if you have an energy model not coupled to land use? It's impossible that this model sees it. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You can have, if you are very, very smart and you have a lot of knowledge and intuition about that, but it's not obvious. It's not obvious. Um, there is research which shows uh, that uh, solar PV is already affecting global silver prices. So... You have a demand from energy affecting materials and prices of silver which go to economy. No? So how can you capture this and understand the, the importance of the problem if you don't have these three dimensions? And then a third example which I like to also to give is the, it's very famous, is the rebound effect. Mm -hmm. So engineers will tell you, no, I will isolate your house, you will save 50% of your energy and then if everybody in the country will do this, then Well, there are a lot of evidence, not only evidence uh, with uh, data analysis that shows that there are rebound effects and even backfire effects It's under some circumstances. Imagine that some person which uh, save this money for heating decides to take anymore. cheap flights to uh, whatever for 30 euros yeah. every weekend. At the end, uh, what you get is a rebound effect mm. uh, because uh, you can only see that if you have economy and social behavior module. Mm. 
So the issue that the renew uh, energy return on energy invested is going to decrease at the beginning, at least of the transition. They don't see all this. And the second possibility with these models is, okay, with these problems, are this representation of reality, what could be the solutions? And in this sense, mm, you can explore alternative narratives or you can change things, I don't know. Uh, so it's more like critique and the other is more propositive. Mm -hmm. It arrives at the right time as well, right? You know, I mean, we also had a lack of imagination for a very long time. And I think now we, we need to propose stuff, not only, I mean, we know that, or we know, a number of people know that green growth is materially not doable or, you know, the, the coupling uh, happens not at a sufficient pace to, to make it worth in the 2050 window. So we know all of that, but what do we do? And I think there, there is a sterile ground that we need to, to make much more fertile and also say that not only it's possible, but there is some interesting policies that can also redistribute some interesting policies that can also have much more interesting benefits from the green growth, which fixes the technical issue, but doesn't touch the societal issue, right? There is a unspoken truth of the green growth that, uh, you know, trickle down economics and, blah, 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 and somehow magically everything is going to solve itself. So the, the hard uh, connection I think helps to well, it's always that. more. It's always easier to criticize than to propose. I yeah. think in every aspect of life, if you can <laughs> see something that you don't like, you will criticize. What do we do? I think this is um, this is natural. Uh, well, I'm not sure if there is enough evidence piling. I mean, evidence uh, not in a scientific sense, but in a volume terms. Because then, when you talk with people or you go to conferences or Mm, most people are very surprised when you show these type of things. Mm. And then, mm, as we were saying before, um, there are different profiles of people working in institutions, no? There are people who maybe are more, let's say, scientific approach to looking for the truth, but if you are looking at an institution which is politically driven, you have to fit there or it, you, you are, this is not your position. Mm. So, we are careerists, which want just to please up, to be up. So uh, even if we are talking about science, uh, well, there are a lot of non-scientific things which are very important. If we have to start wrapping this up, um, I think I'm wondering what is... Uh, okay, so this has been an important next step, the William model. Of course, there are still some elements to, to be finished and all of that. What's exciting for you in the in the pipeline? Like, what do you think is relevant that we still need to do? I think the urgent thing is to make it work and then get results. We have already a, a lot in the pipeline and next year, I'm sure we will have a functioning model. In this project also, this is the normal dynamic. You spend four years developing something. It's difficult to publish while you are working because you are developing. Of course, you can always publish uh, preliminary work. This, for example, creates different problems in different institutions, because in my case, okay, I already, uh, it's like I don't need so much more publications, but we uh, students and PhDs need these publications. So we are research, we are in an university, we are in my group. Uh, we are not a, a research center which has commissioned something so we need to, uh, at the same time, reach uh, project goals, academic goals, group goals. So it's complex. Yeah. No, but let's let's go back to yourself, right? You, Myself, you, okay. You were, uh, you, you went into, so it's kind of an activist reunion that kind of sparked your interest to become a researcher, et cetera, et cetera. Let's imagine you are now the person that kind of inspired you back in the day. You have this model, or how would you try to inspire your, your, your past self somehow, you know? Or Well, may, maybe an answer would be that uh, alone I can't do anything. I yeah. mean, this is a group, a yeah. team work of many people and uh, each of us, we can have some ideas, but it's a group effort. So it should, it, we will have to agree on, on what are the strategies and where do we put time. But I think 
it will be nice to to spread the message and to I think in my experience to allow people uh, playing with these tools it's very very instructive in terms of let's say impact at higher levels this we should uh, think about a strategy because of course we are a small group we are not we don't have connections let's say up so we should build them and this I I cannot say much more. Yeah, mm. yeah, no, but I was thinking, I mean, I'm putting myself in your shoes. Like, what do I do now that I have this, you know, <laughs> this uh, this big tool? Uh, do you try to propose, like, even more aggressive policies and try to see, like, try to make a set Before of, getting results, I mean, yeah. the, these tools are tools for planning the transition, but we don't have to be naive to think that now, in 2023, I can plan... Anybody can plan the transition until 2050, yeah. you know, like you write everything and then you go on holidays, whatever. Yeah. No, it's, it's a iterative process. Every time there will be more information, better data, feedbacks that you didn't realize that are important and are missing. And uh, I think this uh, should be a iterative process with policymakers in order to adapt the plans to the most updated information. This is also why it is socio-political. And the, this tool is helping. Yeah. It's not uh, telling you in an optimization way what to do. It's, for me, it's nonsense. nonsense. Um, in general, I always try to ask for a recommendation or an inspiration in terms of a book or in terms of a movie or in terms of an article or something that perhaps you in your career, it kind of helped you to... Uh, something positive, <laughs> Well, no, um, inspiring in, in sense of, okay, I learned something from it or it, uh, it mm. helps you grow in, 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 the, in the direction, right? Of course, you know, the word three is, uh, is, is said to be a, a doom scenario, but uh, at the end of the day, it helped us grow very much and it's not a doom scenario. That was one of the key turning points in your career, reading The Limits to Growth? or uh, Certainly, I would recommend to anybody interested in modeling. Um, I think the best version to read will be the 2004, written mainly by Donella Meadows, then she died. And this is a book about modeling in which there is no one equation. And it's, going, it's suitable for anybody interested in the topics and really helps you understand what is a model, how to use properly a model, how to play with a model, forgetting about this obsession for numbers and quantification. Quantification is a means uh, to achieve your objective of understanding the, the system. Yeah. So this book is very recommendable. And maybe another book, which for me was very interesting, is a Collapse from Jared Diamond, okay. which is a classical. <laughs> Anybody who likes history, anthropology, is worried about the environmental crisis will find examples of bad developments and societies which manage to avoid worst case scenarios. Okay, yeah, great. I mean, of course, from the Nella Meadows, uh, I would also highly recommend the Thinking in Systems uh, book, which, you know, at the end of the day, we're just... And the, also, maybe if I can recommend third book, yes. uh, Kropotkin, uh -huh. uh, The Mutual Help. How do you yes. translate it in English? I don't know. Yeah. I think this book has over 100 years, but it's amazing. And also because it was published to respond to a scientific paradigm mm -hmm. which was dominant no, about the uh, misinterpreted Darwinism, no? to show how a societal uh, dominant idea can be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I hope we're at that level right now. But uh, <laughs> in any case, many thanks, Inigo, for the, this conversation. And also thanks to you all for you know sticking with us until the end. I think these are complex topics. But if you like this conversation, what I would suggest is to listen to one or two others that, that we have made on the podcast. The, the post-growth project from uh, Julia Steinberger, Jason Haeckel, and Yorgos Kallis. We talked about degrowth models as well with Lawrence Kaiser. So yeah, just go explore more and, and if you want to, to have a further discussion or comments. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Yeah.